so uh, our, our guests, uh, Julia and Jaron here, are joining us. Uh, Jaron has talked to us before, but when he was with a, his uh, father or mother agency, <laughs> and uh, since then, uh, we haven't talked about the Deepwater Horizon specifically here. We've, they've had uh, the Western States uh, Petroleum um, Association came and talked to him. Um, so we, we're just starting to talk about energy and stuff like that, so they're, they're still kind of new. Um, but uh, he'll tell you all about it. These guys will tell you all about it. But um, doing the same things, we were split into two groups, right? We had, we had one entity that handled all of our oil and offshore leases and, and alternative energy. Uh, these guys are from the entity that's now in charge of the environmental regulation and enforcement. We have another separate agency that does the leasing and, the, and, and that side of things. So uh, without uh, further ado, here is uh, the great Pacific Region Director. Hi. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm very interested in the, uh, the coastal management costumes. It'll be a true test of my, my skills as a coastal manager to see if I can <laughs> decipher what, what the costumes actually are. Um, so don't, don't test me. I'll embarrass myself. Um, yeah, uh, as Sean mentioned, um, I came here and spoke to a group of students. It's probably been about three and a half years ago or so. And, uh, and you know, it started to make me feel old because I started to reflect on <laughs> those students are probably now, you know, doctors and lawyers or whatever because so much time has passed. So um, I can reuse my material though, that's the upside. Um, I can give you a brief introduction about me and, and then hopefully we can have some interaction. I can get a feel for you know, how the course is going and what your interests are and, and cater some of the presentation um, to things that would be most interesting to you. But uh, before I do that, I'm going to have Julia introduce herself also. Um, great. Thanks, Julia. Um, and, and feel free at any time to interject with questions for either me or for Julia. Um, we're happy to to answer those, and in some ways, that's probably more valuable than anything we might have pre-prepared. So, um, just some background uh, on on me. I'm um, uh, Jaron. I'm not originally from Camarillo, but I've lived here um, for about 10 years now, and uh, actually lived in uh, in the Valley a little bit before that. Um, and my wife is from Thousand Oaks, so pretty familiar, and have been coming here to, uh, to this campus before it was an actual campus. Um, so it's, it's changed quite a bit, but it's really nice here. I have about 10 years of government experience. And uh, it, I don't know if that seems like a lot or not. I feel like uh, um, maybe it's a good thing, but I've, I've uh, changed jobs and changed responsibilities so much that I still feel like I'm fairly fresh in government. but. Uh, um, to some of you, 10 years may seem like, you know, more than two degrees, right? You could all be um, very, very educated after 10 years. Uh, so I started um, actually coming out of undergraduate work where I studied at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. I um, really focused on athletics for about three and a half years and then started scrambling my senior year to figure out what I was going to do with my life and thought that maybe law school would be a good idea. And, and fortunately, I had a career counselor that said, you know, don't rush into law school. Why don't you work at a law firm for a little bit and see if you actually like it so you don't become one of those, you know, alcoholic, miserable lawyers that uh, exist out there. And um, that's proved to be good advice. I, I did go and, and work at a, a major firm actually here in Los Angeles for a couple of years um, and decided that not only did I want to study law, but that um, I wanted to work in government and I wanted to do resource management. So I went into graduate school in both law and um, marine policy with the idea that um, I was going to uh, position myself to try to get into a resource management job and where all the action is is in in government um, because that's where you're you know you're basically 
trying to come up with a solution without pandering too much to, to either side, right? You're not a developer that's just pushing for your own agenda. You're not um, an environmental group that's just pushing for your agenda. You've got to try to work with both of them and figure out a solution. And so I thought that would be the most interesting. Um, and for whatever you're studying so far in, in, uh, in policy, I think that's one of the major lessons to be learned about policy making is that you have to have all the information in front of you to make a good decision and you have to have as many perspectives and stakeholders represented when you make your decision or it's you know it, it's just not going to be um, it's not going to work as well as as you want it to so um, so I went to University of Miami in Florida and I um, studied both law and uh, or environmental law and uh, marine science and policy and uh, when I graduated from there I went to work at um, the Department of the Interior. And Department of Interior used to have one um, agency that handled all of its ocean issues and it was called the Minerals Management Service. Um, and uh, like Sean mentioned, Minerals Management Service uh, went through some reorganization after the um, spill in the Gulf of Mexico in, in 2010. So what happened was Minerals Management Service was formed from, from two different functional areas. There was basically like a, uh, an operations and regulatory aspect and a leasing aspect. One was in the US Geological Survey and then one was in the Bureau of Land Management. And they brought both of those together to form the Minerals Management Service. And then after the Deepwater Horizon event, they split them back up and then just gave them different names. So in some ways, it was kind of a cycle. It took about 30 years to go from two agencies to one agency back to two agencies. Um, but it's something that sometimes you see in government is, you know, the, there's a constant refinement, but at the same time, some of the same um, issues and lessons keep, keep uh, resurfacing and, and uh, and you end up reliving it. I had, I had a coworker that said, you know, once you've seen the full cycle, then you have to retire. Because she was, she was in two agencies, and then she retired right before we became two agencies again. Because she's like, ah, no, I've, I've seen that. You know, I know how that works. So now I can go do something else and go ski in Colorado or something. Um, Importantly, I just add that um, the the few the, the minerals management service I think it was created was by by um, secretarial decree, sort of an internal policy thing. It didn't need to go through Congress, which is why they were able to, to um, manipulate it back into two agencies so quickly. And there wasn't a massive, huge, year-long congressional battle kind of thing. So that was a, a unique thing about the MMS, uh, at least in its terms of its formation. Yeah. Yeah, and there's advantages and disadvantages, actually, to that. You know, some, they, they call, uh, I don't know, anybody here, like, aspiring lawyers you want to know about the you know three branches of government and checks and balances or any of that no all right well that there's actually a lot of advantages to not being a lawyer but uh, I, I will warn you that if you want to be a coastal resources manager you got to know how to work with or against the lawyers because sometimes they get really involved but um, so uh, the advantage of being organized under a secretarial order is that, again, Congress doesn't necessarily have to get involved. But there's some disadvantages of that as well, because when Congress acts and passes a law, um, that can very clearly define you know, your existence and your responsibility. So for instance, like uh, onshore, the Bureau of Land Management actually has a law. It's called. Uh, uh, the federal uh, it, FLIPMA, um, I can't remember what the acronym is, but just um, it's basically the Federal Lands Act that specifically says there's a bureau, you're going to do this, here's your responsibilities, and, and nobody really messes with them. Um, offshore, it's a little more complicated because you have a, I'll talk about it in the presentation, but you have a whole suite of statutes 
and um, laws that apply, but there's not one single agency that's responsible for all of it, right? Um, with the Bureau of Land Management onshore, you can say, this plot of land is federal land, and BLM, you're in charge of it. Whereas offshore, you can have one agency doing this part, another agency, I mean, um, you know, for example, like, our agency is in charge of regulating oil and gas, meaning just inspecting the facilities, but there's another agency, BOEM, that's responsible for leasing the land so that, the, so that it can be used for that purpose. And then there's another agency, the EPA, that's responsible for ensuring that the water quality um, is met. And there's another agency, the Army Corps of Engineers, that's responsible for per permitting any structures that go in the ocean, and then there's another agency, the Fish and Wildlife Service, that's responsible for preventing any impacts to certain endangered species, and then there's another agency, the uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, that's in charge of uh, different species. So, so there's just an extremely complex environment um, offshore, and I mean, I may be a glutton for punishment, but that's what was exciting to me about it. You know, not only um, is it wonderful to be riding on a boat and having you know the, the ocean breeze in your face but it it's also pretty intellectually a, a stimulating environment because there are so many stakeholders and complex um, regulatory structures so that's a little bit of background on me and how i how i got here but uh now i'm going to ask you a couple of questions so so you're in coastal management you've you've you're you know halfway through the semester, right? Have you all aced your midterm already, or and uh, <laughs> um, so those of you that are here in this course, is this like a, is this is this kind of a one-off course, or is it a series leading to a major? How many people are majoring in something that's kind of like coastal management, environmental science, so, and resource management? So they're all Okay. And this is one of the foundational courses for the resource management. Okay. And and so you've had a little bit of an intro into oil and gas. So what what or energy? What exactly have you have you discussed about offshore energy? Anything? So talkative. <laughs> well what about other issues? So so now I'm gonna put you on the spot and you know your professor's right there. So what's the most interesting issue? that you've talked about so far? <laughs> what do you well, think? Powerful, powerful instructor, I understand that. <laughs> what do you think? Any, anything that really, really strikes you? Whaling? Whaling? Yeah, yeah. Species. yeah. Whaling, whaling is a pretty crazy thing, you know, especially because it, it's, it's one of those weird activities where, you know, it's illegal, but it's legal. Like, what exactly, it, it, in, in some ways, it's easier just to say, we're not gonna do anything with that. Like, you know, a tiger, right? Nobody's gonna touch tigers, because they're, you know, fantastic, and the whole world wants to protect them. But whaling, you know, what do you do? You know, some, some people are allowed to whale them, or, 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 or to hunt them, you know, some, because the, of their cultural purposes, or, you know, other people are allowed to, um, you know, to, uh, to utilize their products and things like that, whereas other people aren't allowed to do anything to them. And so it, it, it uh, creates this complex scenario where, again, you've got you've to manage this activity um, rather than just ban it. Yes? Yeah. Have you, seen, have you seen that photo on the internet where they're like skinning a whale on the deck of a ship and then they're holding up a big sign that says that we're collecting tissue samples, <laughs> right? Because they, they can see that you know, a Greenpeace helicopter or something is circling around them. They don't want to get in trouble. So um, yeah, yeah, very interesting. Um, so well, in, there's not a right or wrong answer, in fact, 
I, I warned you that I'm a lawyer, so I, I kind of thrive on conflict. Hopefully, some people will come out on one side and the other. But w what do you think about ocean energy? Are you in favor of oil and gas development offshore? Anybody? Yeah? Don't be there's no right answer. I'm not going to, you know. You can, good. So the rest of you hate me then, right? You're like, why is this guy here? No. So who, who here is opposed to it? Now, are you opposed to just the oil and gas aspect, but you're okay with, like, renewable? Like, what about windmills or something like that offshore? That's okay? Yeah, that's not going to disrupt your view shed of the, of the Channel Islands? So, so when you're from your guys polling, what are the general public? What do you think? And that's, you think, is that national? Is that the national representation or the state? Ventura County? Right. So has anybody, are you guys water sports people? Has anybody been anywhere near a platform? You've got to be careful because you'll get arrested if you go too close. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so what did you think? Is it, were you just like on a boat and you were kind of passing by it? Is that, yeah? Has anybody like scuba dive near one? No, yeah. Um, so what do you think of those platforms then? Are they eyesores, hideous, you want them gone? Or, I know I can tell you my first reaction, uh, and this is, I mean, I'm responsible for making sure that those structures are, are uh, clean and in compliance with the laws. But the uh, first time I ever went to one um, was on a helicopter. And it's almost kind of like a, uh, you know, an artificial um, sense of reality, first of all. Anybody ever ridden, on, ridden in a helicopter? So it's like a ride at Disneyland. You know, you get in and you're like looking out the window and all of a sudden, you know, there's these little bitty cars and stuff and, and, and it's so quiet and you're moving so quickly, it seems kind of weird. But then, you know, you, you're flying across the, the, the coastline and you get to a, a platform and you, and you land on it and then you're off the platform and, and you don't necessarily get the full sense of how big the structure is. But when I went, on a subsequent time on a boat and was riding in a boat as you approach them, you realize how gigantic and complicated these structures can be and how many different components have to all come together to make sure that that structure functions the way it's supposed to and doesn't you know, malfunction and create problems for both you know, people that are working on it or the environment around it. So that was one of the things that was particularly striking for me is just, you know, the, the immense size of these structures. In fact, the ones in California are among the world's largest fixed platforms. So what happened was most of those were built a long, long time ago and installed. Um, our newest facility is from 1990, which is probably before anybody was born here. Um, and uh, here on the Pacific Coast, the, the Continental Shelf, um, does everybody know what the Continental Shelf is? It's like the, you know, the gradual uh, rocky shoreline as it uh, goes off the coast of the ocean. But it drops really steeply, really, really quickly. So in California, as opposed to the Gulf of Mexico, the water gets deep really fast. So we have platforms that are you know, 3 to 12 miles offshore, but they're in way, way, way deeper water than some of the Gulf of Mexico platforms because they have a gradual, sloping, sandy shelf in the Gulf where you can have facilities that might be 50 or 60 or 100 miles off, but they're not as deep um, of water as what we have out here. So, so the Pacific facilities actually set world records for having like really, really long, they call them jackets, uh, in the water column connected to the ground, which means um, it was a huge deal to get them built here. 
and it's going to be a huge deal to, to, to get them out. Whereas in the Gulf of Mexico, when you get to really deep waters, they have these semi-submersible structures that are just, they just float and then they can anchor down and all you have to do is pull up some anchors and then you can just float that facility somewhere else and use it again, which, out, which with these out here in the Pacific, you, you really can't do. So, um, interesting. So, so, for the most part, people here aren't necessarily keen on offshore oil and gas development off of California, um, but are interested in the idea of a clean way to produce energy or u utilize the ocean resources to produce energy. So that's good. I mean, I think that's pretty, that's pretty standard. That's, that's, that's the stakeholders that we're used to interacting with. Really, most most people in California are um, against oil and gas development, um, but there's a recognition that there's a downside to just taking everything out right now, or you know, ending it all, because there is a um, a pretty significant contribution um, to the economy and to the uh, the national production of oil and gas. Have you guys done, are you, are you going to do any of the, um, the comparisons of like how many windmills it might take to, yet, but we will. yeah, and it's, it's something to look forward to. Again, I'm a big nerd, that's why I get excited about it. But it, it's an interesting comparison to see how many windmills, offshore windmills or onshore, it would take um, to produce the same amount of energy that one platform does, um, depending on the size of the field that it's developing. So. So again, there's always gives and takes. Um, this is part of management and policy making is, you know, what's your, what is it that you're worried about? Are you going to accept a risk of an oil spill for a smaller environmental impact, meaning like one platform with the risk of a spill versus, you know, 100 windmills that take up more space, but then you're not risking a spill. Um, so these are all the kinds of things that, that you have to evaluate and take into consideration when you're making decisions. So that's just me rambling a little bit. Um, as far as... Uh, I was going to say one thing that, that I would yeah. like to, that I would like, I would like uh, once um, a given rig is decommissioned, I think uh, it would be nice if we could have at least one, not so much a rigs to reef, but a, a rigs to lab. Yeah, that would be kind of neat. <laughs> yeah, we we we're, I, I have a couple of slides where we talk about you know decommissioning and, and reefing and and uh, currently there's a program in our uh, sister bureau's renewable energy regulations called the uh, alternate use of existing facilities that actually allows for an oil and gas platform to be left in the water and used for another purpose. So things that have kind of floated around are like, what if you use it as you know, an offshore resort hotel. Uh, there's a lot of corrosion. I don't know how, uh, if you've seen the quarters, like there's a lot of uh, bed bug problems on, on uh, some of the facilities. So, so they'd have to do some major cleaning up, but it would be kind of neat if you're a major uh, scuba diver, it, it would be great to be able to fly out to a platform, sleep on the platform and then go scuba dive all day long. So there's, there's talk of that. There's also talk of um, particularly in the Gulf of Mexico, converting facilities into hospitals. Um, because if you're flying all the way, if you're flying 120 or um, you know, 200 miles offshore, that's a pretty significant flight time. And if someone's injured, it'd be nice to be able to go to a medical facility that's not all the way inland. So they've talked about that as well as, yeah, a marine lab, um, liquefied natural gas, storage facility or conversion facility, um, any number of potential uses uh, uh, of the platforms that haven't necessarily been explored. And <clears throat> part of the reason is, like we talked about before, the, uh, the complex regulatory structure, right? Because when, it's, when a platform is developing oil and gas, it's really clear my agency goes and inspects it. But if it becomes a marine lab, then who inspects it? 
you know, who's, who's in charge of making sure that that marine lab is safe or a hospital, you know, or anything else? That's, those are all the, the kinds of questions that remain unanswered and, and it's always tough. I mean, this is, this is just, you know, me speaking from my opinion is um, you can't necessarily legislate everything, right? Because of the length of time that it takes to get legislation out and, and because it's so hard to get legislators to agree and, and things like that. So it's, it's hard, every law that comes out can't cover every conceivable scenario that you can think of. And then when one, a scenario comes up that you had never thought of, if you have to wait until you pass legislation to be able to handle it, you know, then, then it may become obsolete. So, um, so it creates a lot of challenges and, you know, well, how do you, how do you facil facilitate this changing world but at the same time, not just let it be, you know, a free for all or like the Wild West where people just run out and stake their claim and do whatever it is that they want unregulated. But at the same time, you don't want to completely stifle any, any creative use of our resources because you're waiting for Congress to catch up and, you know, they seem to get a, be getting slower and slower and slower in the, in the laws that they're able to pass each year. So here we go. This is uh, the mission of Bessie. And Bessie is, I wish that, that uh, um, we would have entertained a few other acronyms because what I always hear people think of is a cow. Like Bessie, we're, we're Bessie the cow, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. Some people even joked around and said that they would call it bossy. They put, you know, the bureau of, you put the little O in front of that and then we're, we're bossy because we're regulators, that might work better. But um, regardless, our mission is still very clearly stated. It's to promote safety, protect the environment, and conserve resources offshore through a really vigorous regulatory and inspections program. So one of the things to point out um, that's kind of interesting is, you know, promoting safety is fairly straightforward. Even uh, protecting the environment is pretty straightforward. But uh, when I say conservation of resources or, or conserve resources, what do you think of? It's a trick question, I'll warn you. Do you think, like, sustainability? Or do you think, like, do you think conserve is more like protect? Now, what's the distinction? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's one of the things that that sometimes you know the the lay person that that's not studying you know, the an environmental science or marine uh, resource management area is going to see those as synonymous. But the conservation actually um, implies a degree of use. But what's interesting is in the oil and gas realm, conservation of resources is actually almost the opposite <laughs> of what you would think. Conservation of resources means that you use as much of the resource as you possibly can, meaning you try to prolong the amount of oil and gas resources that you produce. <clears throat> so it creates an interesting dynamic where we, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, where we as a regulatory agency might be in a situation where a company has decided, <clears throat> you know what, we came here, we invested a bunch of money, we produced a bunch of oil, and, and now it's starting to get kind of expensive to maintain these platforms and to, and, and to drill and to manage this reservoir. So we're going to make a business decision that we want to just kind of get out and we're just going to leave this. And from an environmental protectionist standpoint, that might be a good thing. They're like, oh, good, they're ready to go. You know, they can clean up the mess and move out. But from a conservationist standpoint, you'd have to say, well, hold on. You can't leave all those resources in the ground. You know, you can't come and just pluck, you know, the low-hanging fruit and then cut out. You need, as a company, to be 
thinking long term in the way that you're developing these resources because the only reason you're developing them is because we, the government, allowed you to come in and, and do it. So you've got to produce it in a way that's most beneficial for the American people. So it, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a new dynamic, an added complication to regulating that sometimes people don't think of. So just some background, we talked about this um, really quickly. So um, uh, at one point we were USGS and BLM. In 1982 we came together as Minerals Management Service. In June of 2010 we moved the, the aspect of the agency that handled royalty payments on oil and gas into another group called the Office of Natural Resource Revenue. And they got the cool nickname. They're, they're honorable. They call themselves Honor. And we're the cow, Bessie. Um, and, and then what was left was the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Regulation and Enforcement. And that was awful trying to say. And even, come up with, even coming up with an acronym was, was awful. Um, so uh, luckily, we were only that for a year. And then we split into two agencies, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. And uh, as we mentioned, the way they're split up, leasing and environmental analyses and studies are in BOEM. In BSEE, we have production, permitting, and decommissioning. So um, under production or development, we have like approving permits to drill, approving the installation of platforms, approving the installation of pipelines, um, all the inspections of those facilities, uh, enforcement of noncompliance, uh, you know, the, the overseeing of the production to ensure that it's being done in a way that doesn't damage the reservoir and maximizes the productivity, and then the decommissioning and removal of the platform. Can you see? Am I in the way? So Bessie doesn't fund the intertidal monitoring and stuff like that? Nope. That's a studies program. What, there's still kind of an uh, interrelationship between the two bureaus. And what Bessie does from an environmental protection standpoint is if there are issues that we see um, needing research and studies, we propose that to BOEM and then BOEM puts that in their studies plan. Um, however, what we've noticed uh, trending is that um, because of the need for us to be responsive to oil spills, Congress has been generous in providing us funding. So, so Bessie has, in fact, actually funded some of its own studies as well. But what we, we usually do is tie them more to, um, to the emerging technology and some of the technical aspects of operations as opposed to um, baseline monitoring and the environmental studies. Because the idea is BOEM does environmental analysis on our behalf, so they would then um, have a better feel for where the gaps are and where the studies um, should be funded. But we, you know, they, they, they ask us for input and we're involved in that process too. So, you know, we talked a little bit uh, about positions related to energy development. Um, this is a graph that just kind of shows the trend, I mean, it's really, really simple. I love keeping things super simple. There's only one thing really that you have to know about this graph is that everything's going up, right? Doesn't matter what kind of energy is your preference, it's all, it's all increasing, right? So that's just something to keep in mind as a manager when you're making decisions, right? It's, it, in most instances, there's, there's, there's not an absolutely right answer because if there was, you'd already have it, right? I mean, it's usually the situations where there's not a right answer and it's just a matter of you know, where your values are or what your stakeholders you know, hold um, important and are representing back to you. So, so 
in, in many instances, you've got to decide, well, we're going to give a little bit here, we're going to take a little bit here, or we're going to, you know, we're going to focus on development to keep up with our consumption, or we're going to focus on curbing our consumption and, and, uh, and trying to be more conservative in our development. I mean, it's, you know, there's all kinds of ways to solve, solve the problem. It's just a matter of what factors are all coming in to be considered. So this is a map of the United States, right? Did you guys know that? Yeah, you guessed it. Um, and it's got the leasing areas, or the areas that are potentially available for oil and gas leasing. So are you guys all familiar with terms like uh, the political outer continental shelf and the exclusive economic zone and, and those areas, we kind of talked about that. I mean, basically what it is, they're, they're terms of art that are created by laws. Um, and the outer continental shelf is uh, basically the area from three miles offshore out to 200 miles offshore. And like I said, it's a political boundary created by a statute that basically said the submerged lands from you know, the, the state boundary all the way out to the exclusive economic zone, it, we're going to call that the outer continental shelf. So anything that's under the seabed in the outer continental shelf is um, leased and regulated by Bohm and Bessie. But what it doesn't include is the water column. Right? So then, again, we get to this complex regulatory structure. In the water column, you have another agency that's responsible for whatever resources you might find in the water column. So like the fisheries and things like that. Technically, you know, the fish that are in our boundaries are like that of the United States. And so, you know, other people aren't supposed to come and steal our fish. You know, you get, you get into battles with all these other countries about resources, but it's interesting that that some of the most valuable ones that they wanted to make sure and get clear, uh, clearly defined uh, who owns them were the mineral rights, right? Because that's, that's not only like a lifeblood to your, to your society, but you know, if you, even if you're not consuming all of it, that's revenue that you can export. So um, these are the areas that could potentially be leased for energy development. But currently, these are the only ones where actual production is occurring. Small little area right here off Southern California. Um, mostly Western and Central Gulf. There's a few areas of the Eastern Gulf, but as you know, Florida is not in favor of oil and gas development. So, so there, there's fewer and fewer instances of lease sales in the eastern Gulf of Mexico. There is none on the east coast currently, but there's a proposal for a lease sale off of Virginia that may occur. Um, and then there's renewable energy that's occurring on the east coast also. Lots of work up here in the North Atlantic and the Mid-Atlantic related to um, windmills and wind turbines. Did that have Alaska on it? No, I didn't know. No, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's another um, area where there, there is leasing up, up in Alaska. So, again, I mean, full disclosure, I'm a lawyer, so I'm constantly trying to trick you. Um, here's a true or false question. There is currently no oil or gas production offshore in California. Go. Answer. Come on, you know this. Or do you? True. False. <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there is production, but here's a harder question, right? If I really was a jerk, I'd ask you this question, which is what I'm doing right now. So I am a jerk. Is there any new drilling occurring offshore California? 
Do you all say no? True, there is new drilling off of California. So here's, here's the other question. Okay, I'm really messing with you. True or false, there is currently no new leasing offshore California. That is true. All right, so those, that's, the subtle, that's the subtle difference that some people don't forget. I mean, we get, we get questions all the time from, from like Barbara Boxer's office or uh, Feinstein's office where they're like, what are you doing? There, you know, it's illegal for you to be drilling offshore. And, and we heard that there's some drilling going on. What's going on? So we have to explain to them what the actual bans are because years ago they 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 put a a ban on offshore development in california and they did it kind of in an unusual way they did it through an appropriations law does everybody know about i hate to bore you with like all this you know civics stuff and government stuff but it it it, it, it it'll end up being very relevant to any resource management that you do because you kind of have to navigate through these um, regulatory schemes. So, so appropriations law is actually Congress giving money to the executive branch. So the way that the way the Constitution set everything up is, you know, Congress shall have the power of the purse, right? But the president is responsible for implementing all of Congress's laws. So what happens is Congress passes a law and says, okay, executive branch, you have to follow this law. And the executive branch is like, okay, well, we can't do that because we don't have enough people. And so here's all the money and all the resources that we need. And then Congress passes another law in an appropriations bill that says, okay, you now have you know, $20 million to do this. So, so the appropriations committee has become extremely powerful not so much because they have to pass any kind of specific legislation, but they can actually allow the legislation to, 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 to be implemented, to take force by giving the money to the agency. So what happened was Congress at one point said, okay, guess what? No appropriated funds, they put this in a law, they said no appropriated funds can be used for pre-leasing, leasing, or um, any kind of exploration activities off of California. Um, so that meant like in my job, I couldn't use any money from Congress, which is all the money that our agency gets, to do any kind of pre-leasing stuff. Um, that was called the moratorium on new leasing. And they, uh, then they would renew that every year in the budget, and they wouldn't let us do it. But then there's this question of, well, there's already platforms out there. They're already producing. They were like in the middle of plans. If we halted all of the drilling and development activities out there, then the companies could sue the government for breach of contract because they have a contract that says we're allowed to, to, to develop this oil. So the way it was interpreted was, OK, California won't issue any new leases but the leases that are out there can continue to exist. The platforms that are out there can continue to drill on the fields that they're developing, and the production can continue until it's no longer profitable. So that's how you have no development activities, but you still have production and, and, uh, and drilling. That's what Wispa said that some of the members had uh, petitioned the government, got money back, Um, and so here's just a, a closer map of the area. Santa Barbara Channel, these little blue areas are where leasing and leases exist. 
and then you have some further down south off of uh, Long Beach area. Um, and then just some compare and contrast platforms and the coastal countryside that, uh, that we protect. Here's another close up of the facilities. There are 23 platforms. You guys, if you ever go up to Santa Barbara, if you go up to Santa Barbara tomorrow night to enjoy the Halloween party up there, you I'm can sure hopefully. That no. No, all the action is right here at, at Channel Islands. So you don't need to go up there. Um, but as you drive up, you can see all the platforms as you go. If it's a clear enough day, you, you can uh, get a good glimpse of those platforms. Some of them have been there so long that the National Marine Sanctuary is actually surrounds it. Um, it's another interesting thing. Some of those platforms are grandfathered in. And there's actually drilling occurring in the sanctuary because the sanctuary was created after the platforms. So just some more information on uh, Bessie and where we are. Um, we have a headquarters in Washington, D.C. in Herndon. They do uh, high-level functions, develop regulations, oversee the policy for oil spill response and environmental enforcement. Then we have three regions, Gulf of Mexico, Pacific, and Alaska. Um, Gulf of Mexico is the largest. Pacific is the, uh, is the next largest. We have about 50 people. And then Anchorage, Alaska has about 10 or 15. Then the district offices are where the inspectors are located. Those are the guys that, that are kind of the boots on the ground that actually fly out to facilities to inspect them, to walk around with a clipboard and uh, make sure everything's working and, and uh, clean and, and in compliance. And if not, then they write them, they write them up, they give them a, you know, it's kind of like a ticket, but they call it an incident of noncompliance. And depending on how serious that noncompliance is, there might be a fine or an investigation or um, some other penalty that goes with it. So I have a quick question. So if, if uh, the guys that are petitioning for offshore wind off of you know, Cape Cod and stuff, what, they don't have a regional office? No, right now, because um, I don't think there's actually, there's not an actual producing farm out yet. I think they've put in some um, testing facilities on the East Coast. There's like a, you know, there's like a research buoy, and then there might be, um, I think, up with the Cape Wind project, they put one, you know, one um, Met Tower or something up, uh, and so there's been minimal need for inspection. But that's one of the things that we're um, in the process of developing right now is um, how are we going to address the Atlantic region. Like Bohm has a renewable energy group in Herndon that's focused exclusively on renewable energy, and they're um, working on a policy level with BSEE to determine which renewable energy regulations should be under BSEE's um, management. And probably our Herndon office will provide the inspections for those until we can have an Atlantic region built out. But again, inspection is very different for a windmill than, a, than an oil platform. There is a chance of a spill with a, with a windmill, but it's mostly transmission fluid. And it's not nearly the scale and scope. And so you don't need the same kind of safety systems and oversight and continual inspection that you do on the, on the platforms. So that's one of the, thing, one of the questions that's got to be sorted out is, what's an adequate inspection of a wind farm. So, um, you know, I mentioned the complex regulatory stat, uh, uh, structure. So there's a number of statutes that are involved, including the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, which is the primary one um, that gives us our responsibility. But all that uh, responsibility is given to the Secretary of Interior. And then the secretary can kind of do whatever he or she wants um, underneath that. And that's why you know, we might be created or split or merged or anything. 
depending on what the secretary wants to accomplish. So National Environmental Policy Act, is everyone familiar with that? We talked about that. That's planning and providing information and analysis to the decision maker. Um, Clean Air Act, that's under the EPA. Um, Coastal Zone Management Act, which requires um, federal activities to be consistent with the state's coastal management plan and allows the states to be more involved in activities that the federal government permits. Clean Water Act, also EPA. Oil Pollution Act, which is partly us um, in the preparation of oil spill response plans, um, both at a regional level and an area level. Um, royalties, Offshore oil Royalties Management Act, MMPA for marine mammals, ESA for other endangered species, and, uh, and there's a whole list of other ones that, that may come up. You know, National Fisheries Enhancement Act is the one that applies and is relevant to the Rigs to Reef program. So every once in a while, depending on the specific situation, there could be a whole list of other ones. So <clears throat> again, the, uh, the major areas of focus, promoting safety, that's done through an inspection force uh, that goes out to the facilities inspects everything that's occurring. You know, it could be anything from, you know, are the stairs on the, on the platform wet to make them slippery? Is there a handrail? Or it could be something much more technical, like, you know, the production systems, are they working? Are they in working order? You know, are there pieces of it that are corroded? Are some of the valves, you know, in the right position? Are they in a bypass position? Any of those things. Um, can be inspected and potentially cited. But OSHA does too, right? Or does, do you guys take the role of OSHA? We take the role of OSHA offshore. So if this were an onshore facility, yeah, OSHA would be uh, managing those like uh, human safety aspects to make sure that the, that the working environment is safe for the people that work there. But since OSHA doesn't do that offshore, we have to incorporate some of their requirements and then uh, make sure that, that uh, we enforce them. Um, so mentioned protecting the environment. Um, we do that through the ways that are pointed out here. NEPA is required for any federal action. So a permit's not approved unless it's very clear that the environmental impacts have been analyzed. Um, then we do a thorough technical review as well of the permits so that you fully understand what you're allowing to occur in addition to what potential environmental impacts there might be. And then in any situation where um, there's a level of discomfort, we have the option of adding conditions to the permit. And just say, well, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do this, we'll allow it, but only if you add you know, these extra protective measures. And they, there can be a lot of things. Like we just, we just um, approved um, an activity offshore that, that uh, potentially would create some noise issues underwater. So one of, the, one of the mitigations was a marine mammal observer there on site, making sure that you're not, you're not adversely affecting the whale population while this activity is going on, things like that. Then I mentioned the environmental studies. Most of them are, are funded through our sister agency, BOEM, but many, of the, many times it's at, at our request. Um, and occasionally we'll, there, we've got an expanding budget, so we do some of our research on our own as well. Then, uh, this is back to what I was talking about before, the conservation of resources. That, that uh, is, has a very, very specific meaning in the realm of oil and gas, which is you know, preventing waste, maximizing the ultimate recovery, and then protecting rights of other interested stakeholders. And that includes the federal government, because we have, we have a royalty interest in whatever production is coming out. One example is, uh, you guys ever drive on the 101 north and you pass La Conchita? 
and it's always flaring. Yeah, they have to get permission to be able to do that because that's technically um, gas. That that is a resource that could be sold, you know, and and royalties could go to the government. So what has to happen is uh, the gas has to be such a poor quality that that it would not be beneficial to try to clean it up and then sell it to the utility company, but then they still have to get a permission from us to, um, to, to burn it up. It's, they couldn't just release it because that's, that would be a violation of the Clean Air Act, but they can get permission to, to burn it up. So anybody ever go to Summerland? Summerland Cafe, have some lunch there? So right across the street from the Summerlin Cafe, there's a park, and you can see this view. This was taken like, I don't know, maybe a year ago. And then this is a view of it from the 1920s. So, I mean, that's an argument. I'm, I'm neutral, honestly. I'm totally neutral on um, development of offshore oil and gas. Like, what I've always said is, if it's gonna be there, then you have to know that there's going to be these trade-offs and it needs to be heavily regulated. Um, but I've never said, no, it shouldn't be there because I've, I've witnessed instances where you can actually, through good regulation and, and good policy, actually make things cleaner, safer, better, you know, go through res restoration efforts um, and, uh, and, and I like to show this as a good example of how um, regu regulation and development can work together to accomplish everything that you're trying to do as a coastal resource manager, right? Um, then we mentioned decommissioning. Uh, right now, uh, we don't have any decommissioning projects, but as I mentioned, we have some of the largest, most complicated um, and heavy structures in the world that have also become um, great places for fish to, to grow. And it's slightly different than, um, you know, th there was a lot of debate over whether, whether the platforms attract fish versus grow fish. So, and the difference is attracting fish means you know, you're, you're just stealing them from a natural reef. You're taking them from a natural habitat to an unnatural habitat, and that's disruptive, right? So even though, you know, I'm counting the fish and there's a whole lot of fish around these platforms, that's a problem because they're, they're just being attracted from another location where they would normally be. But um, we've actually done a, a lot of research, and the research indicates that, in fact, it's not just attracting them from another spot it's actually creating an environment where they can grow, where they can um, increase their numbers. Um, and that's interesting, especially if you're a fisherman, or if you're a scuba diver, you know, the, that, that's very interesting. But what it does from a resource manager's perspective, well, let me put that to you. Here's a question. You think that's a good thing or a bad thing, that it, that, that it grows fish. Let's make the assumption that science has proven that the, the, the platforms grow fish. I think it is a good thing, but I, I say that with a grain of salt and caution because at the same time it also gives a small sense of look how great you can go to the more when you're not really considering you know, the former factors. You board up a little bit. There is still the risk of the pollution, the spills, the toxins. Right. Yeah, I, I, and that's true. I mean, I hate to break it to you, but as a resource manager, it, like, there's har hardly ever like a right answer. It's always like, oh, it depends. I don't know, or does that mean this or that? So it, in this instance, like, if you say, if you make the assumption that platforms 
grow fish. You might initially think, oh, that's good, right? They're good for the environment. Well, there's a requirement to decommission. So this good thing has to come out sometime. So what does that mean? Or what are you, what are you going to do with that? It, 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 and, and you know, that's a fair point about, you know, positionally, you know, what's the purpose of these platforms and does that, you know, is that a foot in the door to try to push a different kind of agenda? But even setting that aside, you've got like a real logistical problem of what's going to happen to these fish when I take the platform out? Where are they going to go? Are they going to die? You know, or you know, should that factor into the decision to leave them in? Right? I mean, this is, this is an interesting situation where sometimes people that may be against each other or, or aligned then turn and, and, and end up being against each other. Same thing, uh, same thing with renewable energy. It's another one of those scenarios where, you know, we talked here in this class, like some, some people were in favor of windmills, right? Well, did you hear about Cape Wind? Where, well, there, there, was a, there was an instance in Cape Wind where they hit a snag because they thought they had found a position where they could, they could put the windmills, and then they found out that there was an indigenous community that went to a specific spot to worship the sun that was going to be uh, uh, impacted by placing the windmills right in that spot, right? So normally you would have, um, you know, maybe uh, the environmental groups and the indigenous country, uh, uh, indigenous peoples aligned against an oil and gas project, but then you've got another scenario where oh, maybe you've got some environmental groups that are advocating for a wind farm, some indigenous groups that are advocating against it, and then other environmental groups advocating against it as well, and then guess who gets caught in the middle? The resource manager, right? You're stuck trying to figure out how do I address all of these concerns? Is there a way to mitigate this? Is there, is there anything that can be done? You know, can we put them further out? There was a quote from I'm trying to remember which secretary it was. Watt, I think it might have been um, Interior Secretary Watt said that um, those platforms off the 101, you know, as you're driving up there here in the Pacific region, all you have to do is hold up a dime and you don't even see them. It's no big deal. I don't know, dimes holding right up to your eye can be pretty big. And the, and the platforms are really, really obvious out there. Um, so, you know, it, it, it becomes this question of, well, what can you do to mitigate this, these issues? Um, so, <clears throat> with that, I think I'm getting close to the, to the end. Yep. Um, that's pretty much uh, all that I had prepared. I, I, I'd say the, the the interwoven theme throughout most of what I shared today was uh, that being a coastal resource manager can be exciting, but not necessarily for the reasons that you think that it would be exciting. Ex it's exciting because it's, a, it's an extremely complex field that really, really does boil down to your ability to understand stakeholders and respond to them. And, uh, and in, in many ways, my job is easier now than it was before because I would say more than being a coastal resource manager, now I'm a, I'm a regulator. And in some ways, regulation is easy. I just say, well, what's the rule? Are they following it? Which is very different than you know, a more philosophical question of, well, what, what would be best to do in this particular situation? And that's a much harder question, but at the same time, it's also has the potential to be really, really rewarding. And that's one of the benefits of being a coastal uh, resource manager is when you get all of these parties together, you know, with all these different values and positions, and, and you listen to them and you hear them and you're able to come up with a solution that, that allows, um, uh, allows your you know responsibilities to be fulfilled while at the same time responding 
to all those interested parties, it, it feels good. It's actually a really, really rewarding. So with that, um, thanks very much for, for having me here. Um, my colleague, Julia, I don't know if she has some other things that she'd like to add or anything that, that's a... Yeah, well, I mean, like I said, it, in, in my position as a regulator, it's easy because I don't necessarily have to take a position for or against renewable energy. I just have to wait until it's there, and then when it's there, I need to say, okay, well, they need to be following the laws. And, and that's also, in some ways, the difficult position that our sister bureau, BOEM, is in because... Um, they haven't necessarily um, been in a position where they can come out and advocate in favor of, yes, we want renewable energy. So, so when it comes to particularly anything in federal waters, um, the federal government has to wait for the state to say they want it. And you'll notice on the East Coast, the places where projects are being proposed are places where states just decided to push it. I mean, Oregon, Oregon um, has a research lease and is going to have some test um, facilities out. The first, the first floating wind turbines um, in the U.S. will likely be off the coast of Oregon because at some point Oregon just decided this is what we want and we're going to move forward with it and we're going to make it happen. So, yeah, it's not... But I guess maybe I can ask it a different way. So have you guys taken any steps to see if you could help streamline the permitting process on your side, or is that, does that not really seem to be an issue from your perspective? Um, well, th in, in the agency that I'm in now, it's not, it's not much of an issue. Yeah. Um, it's more of a, a, a wait for it to be ripe. Um, but and then you guys would weigh in after it's been permitted. Well, we'd, we would weigh in um, once a lease is issued and construction is being considered. So the way a renewable energy project works is um, a lease is issued, then you have um, uh, like a constructions and operations plan, COP, um, that describes you know, how many turbines you're going to build and what, what kind kind of turbines and things like that. And then after that, then there's some installation permits that need to be acquired. So our agency would, would uh, start getting involved at that COP stage once the actual operations plans start coming in. But what, what BOEM has done, and, and again, I'm speaking for a sister bureau sure. because they're not here, but this is what I used to do um, before I took this job. Um, Bohm did find some ways to streamline the process so that you could do fewer um, environmental um, documents so that the process wouldn't take so long. I mean, in theory, the way, the way the oil and gas process is set up is you do a NEPA document at a national stage, which is a five-year program. You do a NEPA document at a regional stage with a lease sale. You do a NEPA document at a site-specific stage with a DPP, with a development and production plan. So that's three different EISs, and an EIS takes sometimes two years to do. So right there, before you even get to drilling a well, it's taken six years. Um, so with renewable energy, that was just not feasible. They didn't have the same kind of money or resources or time to wait that long. So what Bohm tried to do was find ways um, to streamline the process. So for instance, issuing a lease, which is essentially a piece of paper, could be done at the same time as 
approval of a construction operations plan, right? Because what's the environmental impact of me signing a sheet of paper and giving it to you? Right? And because you're not going to do anything until your COP is approved. So, you know, if you could do them both at the same time, then you're going to have more detailed information for your environmental analysis and you're going to have less wait time. So, yeah, they, they, they've worked on areas like that to, to streamline it so that, so that uh, while the industry matures, that, that uh, projects won't be held up. And I should say that I brought a little box of Halloween candy <laughs> for anybody that wants to ask questions. But I, and you'll, also notice, you'll also notice that it's open because I couldn't wait and I had to eat a piece myself. But that's all right. I deserve it for all this talking that I did. So yeah, I'll, uh, I'll pull out you know, a Kit Kat or a peanut butter cup for somebody that has a good question. It's got to be a good question. No takers? Yes. You don't want candy? <laughs> yeah, okay, sure. I'll, um, I'll take the candy so for the answer then. For the leases, how far down do the mineral, the mineral rights go down for the, uh, for the state? So, for instance, like if you have the lease, could you go down? And like, so we had a representative from the Western States Petroleum Agency say that there's some beds that they really like to get the oil from. Could you go down below basically the mineral right control area and move over? Or the, uh, well, when you. Well, the beauty is, from the government's perspective, is we own all those resources, like all the way to the down to the core of the earth, right? So it just depends on what the lease says. So normally we write the lease so that, yeah, you can go as deep as technologically you're able to go. Um, but what gets tricky is that can always be tweaked. So they have another thing that's called um, uh, record, record titled interest versus operating rights interest. And um, what happens is if a company um, obtains a lease from the government, they own the mineral rights all the way down. But then they can turn around and sell what they bought from us to another company. So if company A owns everything, and then they turn around and sell to company B, everything down to 5,000 feet, and then they can turn around and sell to company C from 5,000 feet to 10,000 feet, you know, or, or anything like that. They can subdivide it however they want to make it like extremely complicated. Um, but generally when it's coming from the government to, to another entity, it's, it's the record title interest, which is everything in full, and then the operating rights interest is something that's limited. You know, it, Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and lateral movement is prohibited. Like, you can go down, but you can't go to the sides. Like, if you go outside of your lease, that's an issue that happens now. Like, since there's no new leasing, in fact, maybe I can pull back the, uh, the, one of the maps. Since there's no new leasing, there we go. Um, this is the only place where you can drill down. Like if, if this platform right here drilled out to like right there, it's illegal. They're, they're stealing from the taxpayers. You should be enraged that that happens. Even though the pocket of, the pocket of oil might be bigger. Yep. They just can't have their, their drill tip past that. Right. Yeah, the bottom hole location cannot exceed the lease boundaries. And if, if for instance, like this lease was owned by somebody other than this lease, like if there are two different owners for these two, you couldn't even drill within 500 feet of this line without permission from us. We'd have to approve that so that, so that you weren't trying to steal from the other owner on the other side. They call it drainage. So there's all kinds of different ways that you could drain from another, from another lease or another field. Anybody else? I have the most since nobody is going to be playing. Uh, so uh, after the Deepwater Horizon, so after Exxon, we have OPA 90 and we have all you know, these, these new, new regulations and new policies. Um, what's happened since the Deepwater Horizon? 
Uh, since Deepwater Horizon, most of the focus has been on the regulatory standards as opposed to the, the broader like statutory standards. Um, and most of that focus has been like um, blowout preventers. Like we issued a new blowout preventer rule. You know, our reorg was a big um, um, aspect of the outfall of Deepwater Horizon. Um, No, it's for all blowout preventers. Well, it's um, it, it actually was was primarily for um, like testing of. So it, it's it's partially, um, you know, from here on out the blowout preventers that are manufactured and provided, but then retroactively it's it's testing of the installed blowout preventers. Um, is where most of the uh, of the efforts has been because that's that's based on most of the reports after the fact that's been primarily um, the consensus uh, finding where where the failure occurred that that and the systematic lack of safety culture in 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 the uh, in the company um, you know there are certain you know, procedures and policies that weren't followed and things like that. And that's addressed by um, another program that we call the Safety and Environmental Management Systems, SIMS, which is an attempt to get companies to not just follow the regulations, but to use their own proactive approaches to be safer without us having to tell them from a regulatory perspective what they need to do. So. so one thing that I think is harder for you guys to understand is it used to be back in the day when these platforms went in, it was a thing. It was Unical oil that, that drilled the oil and sucked the oil out and processed the oil. And now it's much more this, uh, this, this uh, multiple players. So there's a, a drill company and there's a, this company and that. So that makes it a lot harder for you guys, right, to, to, to well, in, of in some see sense, all things have been... All the T's have been crossed and I's have been dotted. Well, and what we've tried to do as a regulator is simplify it and just say everybody's accountable, right? So it's not a question of, oh, whose fault is it? It's just something wrong. Okay, pff, you're all at fault, right? And you guys sort it out. Um, because, yeah, you don't want a, a lot of finger pointing. I mean, this is, a, um, this is actually um, a lesson learned with all those statutes and all those different regulatory agencies that are involved in resource management, it can get really confusing and people be like, well, this is my little piece right here and that's all I do and that's somebody else's problem over there. And then when something slips through the cracks, it's really easy to just say, it's not my fault, I was doing my little piece. And um, you certainly don't want that to happen if there's an accident or some other incident offshore. So the way we built our regulatory program is it doesn't matter if you're the owner of the lease or the operator of, like the designated operator of the facility or the owner of the, of the rig, or the contractor that's working the rig. Like if something goes wrong, you all get cited. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I haven't been all that involved because we don't have a lot of icy conditions out here in the Pacific region. We're we're insulated from from most of those. So, so I mean, just generally speaking, I mean that that's a major concern that our Alaska regional director, my counterpart in the Alaska office, is spending a huge amount of time working on because, in addition to um, First of all, the stakeholders there, which include um, Alaska Natives and Eskimo, Eskimos, and, and you touched on whaling before. You know, there is subsistence um, hunting 
that's affected by the operations up there that's unlike down here. Uh, and so though that requires a huge amount of collaboration and interaction with the local stakeholders in Alaska. But then added to that is this uh, you know, added um, difficulty with just drilling a well in you know, the North Slope in, in these freezing temperatures, drilling through ice. Um, you know, instead of trying to install a platform, sometimes they build entire islands. Um, sometimes the roads exist because of ice, so they build ice roads and then they melt. Uh, um, so, so logistically, there's all kinds of uh, difficulties to the operations. So they've actually, um, as as the the reality of drilling in Alaska gets closer and closer, um, they've actually created an Arctic forum, so that that most of the other, like Alaska, Canada, even some of the Scandinavian countries that drill in those Arctic um, temperatures can all get together and compare notes and come up with some, some Arctic standards. We're also in the middle of drafting and publishing a, an Arctic rule is what they call it, which has the, has the added um, requirements and, and regulations associated with any drilling activity that's going to be performed up in, in Arctic areas. Okay. And then one thing we also have talked about is that um, we have talked about is uh, seabed mining. So do you guys see anything like that on the horizon? Are there any resources out towards Hawaii or something like that that uh, you've had any proposals? Um, the last I heard was that there was some talk of mining magnesium and silver and gold and other um, um, hard minerals in uh, the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas was the proposal. Um, but the difficulty is the authority that we have to, to regulate and to lease is, yeah, is, is actually defined as, like the Outer Continental Shelf is defined as, you know, these political boundaries as measured off the states of the Union, right? So, uh -huh. so any territories or commonwealths so no don't Puerto fit Rico the definition, or... right? Uh -huh. So they're, I think they're going to work on addressing that. And then there's some talk of maybe BOEM issuing geological and geophysical permits for anybody that's kind of speculating on the use of those minerals. But um, from my understanding, the places where the, um, where the resources are don't have the regulatory structure or statutory authority to, to allow for the development yet. But um, there is some possibility maybe off Hawaii and things like that. Every once in a while, somebody will come in with an idea and and make a pitch and then there'll be a number of complications and things kind of slow down and disappear and then they come back about five years later. So it's been a few years since we had a discussion with a company that was interested, but that was the challenge. I think they wanted, yeah, in the Marianas somewhere and there was no statutory authority. Anybody else? Should we, should we let these guys go or should we let you do a chance to ask any of your energy questions? Well, you guys were great because I have to admit there, there was a previous time when I spoke to a class in a room like this and they all stared at their screens. So, <laughs> so either you were just nicer to me or you know, maybe, the, maybe, maybe I practiced a little yeah, bit more so it was more better. <laughs> all right, well, let's thank these guys.